What a dungeon. The Forbidden Woods could ride on its atmosphere and music alone. It is to me where Wind Waker starts picking up. The Forsaken Fortress is okay, and the Dragon Roost Cavern is neat, but the Forbidden Woods is Wind Waker's first truly great dungeon, and boy does it deliver. The dungeon is full of great platforming, still a new thing for console Zelda games at the time of release as well as some cool puzzles that don't break from the dungeon's immersive atmosphere for a second. I particularly appreciate how useful the Deku Leaf is in the Forbidden Woods, as well as how great the Boomerang is compared to its Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask incarnations. The enemies are nicely placed and well-spaced, and oh boy are the boss and mini-boss a blast! Mothula rocketing around the arena was a sight to behold my first time playing, and I appreciate the reference to A Link to the Past and the recent Oracle of Seasons. Kaladimos is one of the best bosses in the game and is both visually stunning and fun. I also appreciate how it gives us a bit of insight into Deku Baba biology, a nice touch by Nintendo, not unlike those in Iconic Hassle and Skykeep. My only complaint with the Forbidden Woods is its originality. It is not unoriginal, and it certainly does things like feature a lot of platforming and Deku Nut puzzles, but it doesn't go the distance that even the Fire Temple and Ocarina of Time went to set itself apart from the increasing number of Zelda dungeons. With all that said though, the Forbidden Woods is where the Wind Waker hits its first stride. The Lanairu Mining Facility could easily be my favorite Zelda dungeon of all time if there weren't five even better dungeons out there. It is very different from past Zelda dungeons, sticking the player in what is more or less a rundown industrial facility. The Great Bay Temple and Goron Mines both touched on this in previous Zelda games, but never do you feel so out of place in a dungeon as you do in the mining facility. Running around conveyor belts, fighting automatons, and knocking away missiles is something I never expected to find myself doing in a Zelda game. The mining facility has also placed a huge emphasis on platforming, and as a 3D platformer fan, I loved every moment of it. I will never forget the first time my jaw dropped during a dungeon in a Zelda game. When I first struck a time shift stone in the rusty old dungeon, and saw the entire room light up and the music take a turn for the eerie and menacing. Up until that point, I found the music during the present to be grating on the ears, even though it was a remix of the Spirit Temple music from Ocarina of Time. The past version, though, is now my second favorite dungeon theme ever. Skyward Sword had great music for its dungeons in general. The Lanaira Mining Facilities track definitely takes the cake. Speaking of references, I'm pretty sure they reused the drumline of the Woodfall Temple's music from Majora's Mask and the past version of the dungeon thing. Also, I thought the Gale Bellows was a nice throwback to the Minish Cap's Gust Jar. I wish it was more useful, though. My only real problem with the dungeon was its boss and mini-boss. Armos statues have always been a pain, but the Armos statues in Skyward Sword left me screaming in rage and frustration almost every time I fought one. They were horrible to fight. The boss Moldorak was cool in its design and concept, and the music was fantastic, but it is a shame Moldorak was so ridiculously easy. If anything, it should have been the first boss in the game, not the third. The Lanai Reminding Facility was a blast, and it blew me away as a longtime Zelda fan. However, there was another dungeon in Skyward Sword that shocked me even earlier in the game, the Skyview Temple. Now, the Skyview Temple is not the best dungeon out there on its own. It is relatively simple and doesn't do very much to separate itself compared to later dungeons in the game. What makes the dungeon, though, is the fact that it is the first dungeon. Most first dungeons are simple and rather dull, 
After all, the most exciting part of any adventure is typically not the very beginning. However, Skyward Sword turned that on its head by presenting players with a very atmospheric, beautiful dungeon with eerie ambient music growing and growing into fierce and frightening music, challenging enemies, an amazing item, and a very tough and thrilling boss fight. Every enemy is placed perfectly. Every room has a purpose. The music grows as you get closer to the mysterious boss and fades as you back away in fear. Some rooms glow with dazzling mushrooms. Others have dangerous spiders lurking about above your head. The mini-boss is a challenge that asks players to build on what they have learned about the game's one-to-one -one sword combat, and then the boss asks them if they have mastered it. The item you get in the dungeon, the beetle, is my favorite item in the game, and the game does a great job at introducing you to how to use the beetle by hiding the exit from the mini-boss room up through a hole above the player's head and outside the actual room. It is Nintendo's teaching abilities at its finest. Girahim is a fantastic first boss. I know I just argued that Moldorak should have been the first boss, but that was because it was easy, and the first boss in a Zelda game is almost always easy. Girahim is an exception, and his intimidating battle was a great taste of what was to come later in the game. It is a shame few other bosses in the game lived up to his potential. Skyview Temple may not be the best dungeon on its own, but your first visit to it is currently the best introduction to a dungeon you could ever ask for in a Zelda game. Ah, Twilight Princess's best dungeon and possibly the weirdest dungeon in Zelda history. One thing you will see in common with all the remaining entries in the, on this list is that they all have incredible atmospheres. Heck, even everything in this half of the list so far has a great ambiance. This dungeon is no exception. Between the killer music, the weird gravity-defying physics of the city's denizens, and the howling wind, the city in the sky is absolutely hypnotic. The great usage of your surroundings is another thing that makes this dungeon very memorable. The second claw shot was a very welcome item, and it was thrilling to grapple back and forth between gratings to get to far away or high up locations. This dungeon made the claw shot, and it was awesome. The only real problem I had with City in the Sky was its mini-boss and boss. The arrow foes was okay, nothing special but not bad, but the real disappointment was the boss Argorok. I know a lot of fans love this dragon fight, but its epicness was purely cinematic. You don't actually do very much during this fight other than claw shot around, and Argorok, like the rest of Twilight Princess's bosses, is child's play to beat. For such a fantastic dungeon with excellent possible connections to the Four Swords games, the Minish Cap, and Skyward Sword, it is a shame its end was so anticlimactic. First of all, I must get it out of the way that this dungeon has what very well could be my favorite song in Zelda history. Not only does it perfectly fit the spooky atmosphere of the dungeon, but it is super catchy, features both a didgeridoo and an organ, among other cool instruments, and beautifully captures the feel of going on an adventure deep underground in an ancient temple, which is really one of the things that Zelda is all about. The Earth Temple is a blast to play, and I look forward to it every time I play Wind Waker. It already starts out great with being able to fly around with the cute Rito Girl medley, but it gets better and better as you proceed deeper into the dungeon. Light puzzles that you need medley to solve? Check. Cool mist that curses you unless you blow it away? Check. Mirror shield that blows stuff up? Check. Zelda block puzzles with a light puzzle twist that you have to cooperate with medley to solve? Check. Even the enemies are perfect. Wind Waker's floor masters are at their scariest as they lurk about underneath the fog, that whirling, howling sound echoing throughout the room. Redead may not take very many hits to defeat in Wind Waker, but their scream and their appearance is scarier than Ocarina of Time and even Twilight Princess could manage. I also think it is super cool that you can take out Redead from a safe distance by combining Medley's scouting capabilities with the Tingle Tuner's bombs. From invisible pose to lantern-carrying moblins to bubbles that spring to life, all of the enemies in the Earth Temple work. The only thing I would improve would be the mini-boss and boss. 
Neither fight is unenjoyable per se, but Wind Waker's style foes are a bit of a chore to fight, and Jalhalla, although cool, is rather on the easy side. As a side note, I thought it was really cool how the lighting effects worked in the remade Earth Temple on the Wii U. The long shadows cast by Link and Medley as they descended staircases were a great touch. After the incredible Skyview Temple and Lanai Mining Facility, I really was not expecting Skyward Sword to present me with another dungeon of that caliber, let alone an absolute masterpiece. The Ancient Cistern is jaw-droppingly phenomenal. It starts the moment you step inside and are greeted by the dungeon's beautiful music and breathtaking visuals. The dungeon is a beauty just to run around, and I had to stop multiple times just to appreciate the view and the music. The Ancient Cistern is very novel in many ways, and it shakes up what we typically would expect from a Zelda dungeon. It is a water dungeon in a Zelda game that is not annoying. It is also Skyward Sword's shadow-themed dungeon. It is entirely based on a South Asian legend of the Buddha and the underworld. It even tells the story of the legend without mouthing a single word. Great puzzles, the shock of going down a drain and winding up in the land of the dead, and a helpful item all make the ancient cistern very fun to travel through, and I always get a tinge of sorrow when it is over. The best part of the dungeon is probably the boss and mini-boss, though. The ancient cistern has the most challenging mini-boss in the game, and the fight always leaves me sweating when it is over from the rush of adrenaline and the quick movements necessary to bring it down. I'm also absolutely certain the Stallmaster is a reference to the master style foes from the Catfish Small and Link's Wake. Kalakdos was easily Skyward Sword's best boss. Like the rest of the bosses in the game, Kalakdos was not particularly challenging, but unlike Wind Waker and Twilight Princess, I believe this was due to my own skills as a gamer. The boss battle is an epic fight full of surprises, the strategy is super cool, the sound effects are intense, and the music is mind-blowingly awesome, almost Kingdom Hearts-like. There is really nothing to hate about this fight. Literally, my only qualm with this dungeon was that the whip was just a useful item rather than an awesome one. It wasn't even a bad item. That's how amazing the Ancient Cistern is. I would also complain, and this is really a flaw with the dungeon itself, that the cursed Bokoblin just aren't as challenging to fight as the Redead of old. But the Ancient Cistern is one of the best dungeons Nintendo has to offer, and every Zelda fan should try to have the opportunity to experience it. At my number one spot is one that probably anybody who played Ocarina of Time was expecting. The Forest Temple was the perfect way to start the adult segment of the game and introduce the player to the higher difficulty of the temple-style dungeons. It's not the most original dungeon out there. The Forest Temple had the title of Most Topsy-Turvy Zelda Dungeon back before Majora's Mask came out, but since then many Zelda dungeons have outdone the Forest Temple as far as originality goes. However, it is still pretty novel and is one of the most unique dungeons in Ocarina of Time. Traveling through the ruins of a mansion, castle, or art gallery is ridiculously cool. I liked how eerie the dungeon was, despite not being the shadow-themed dungeon in the game. The echoing, almost happy music, the bubbles flying around everywhere, and the art-loving pose made the Forest Temple an absolute treat to experience. Speaking of pose, I liked how the dungeon's mini-boss was split up into four separate encounters. First, you have to shoot paintings of Joel and Beth. Next, you have to put together a broken puzzle of Amy. And then what's really cool is that the fourth one, Meg, comes right to you. She doesn't wait for you to find her. You've slain her sisters, and all she wants is revenge. Seeing her crying in the elevator room before you fight her was a great touch of drama that Nintendo added to the dungeon. I've always wondered, though, which room Meg had previously been hiding in. Phantom Ganon is a great fight. He is very challenging, and I've seen some friends get very frustrated with him. It's a great foreshadowing of the fight with Ganondorf later in the game, though and helps to build up towards the future confrontation. Putting myself in Link's shoes, I always feel a touch of anger as Phantom Ganon, the being who kidnapped my best friend Saria, reveals himself and laughs at my misery. I love the strategy of shooting him in paintings, as well as the classic game of tennis afterwards. He always makes me think of the Headless Horseman. The Forest Temple is a masterpiece. It and the Ancient Cistern are the best dungeons Nintendo has released yet. 
For me though, the Forest Temple wins out because of all the great memories it makes me think of whenever I play. It is a very meaningful dungeon, and I believe that is a sentiment I share with a lot of gamers, but maybe younger people will feel that way in the future about the Ancient Sister. In any case, to me, the Forest Temple is the best dungeon in a 3D Zelda game, and really any Zelda game in general. And I believe it is something everybody who has even been interested in video games needs to experience. Thank you for watching my video.